The Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the man who's nearly three times as old as one of our gold medal winning Olympic skateboarders, it's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? What a golden week for Australia, James. I'm loving it. Absolutely. Well, this week we're throwing out the rule book on the Chanticleer podcast for a little bit of a special episode with a true gold medalist of Australian journalism, the Australian Financial Review's outgoing editor in chief, Michael Stutchbury, to look at the biggest stories from his incredible 13 year career. Well, welcome back to the podcast, Stutch. We're thrilled to have you on in your final hours on the floor of the AFR newsroom. How are you feeling about it all? Uh, yeah, it is, a, it is an odd feeling after 13 years to be editor-in-chief of Australia's premier business and finance publication with luminaries such as our Chanticleer columnists here today. And so it has been a real privilege and uh, it's been a, been a good in, in, in innings. Uh, it's the longest stretch of any editor-in-chief of the Financial Review, and uh, by now it sort of feels like it, <laughs> and I think I'm the oldest <laughs> ever editor-in-chief as well. So I think it's good to go out with the place in good shape and to hand over to a very worthy successor, the ideal person to replace me, James Chessel. Fantastic. Well, as mentioned, we're going to trawl through some of your greatest hits at the fin, pick your brain about the the year ahead, but first let's start with this week's big news. and. The week started with a stunning market route, a sell-off sparked by a worse-than-expected job numbers in the US on Friday night that quickly spread around the world. In Australia, local shares lost 5.7% across Friday and Monday and were hit particularly hard on Monday, a day when only two of our top 200 companies finished in the green. But we got off lightly compared to Japan, whose market plunged 12.4% to record its worst day since the 1987 Black Monday crash. Stutch, let's start with you. You've seen a few sell-offs in your time, including that uh, 1987 crash and the GFC. Most recently, we we really dipped at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. What did you make of Monday's route? Was this a memorable one, or did it, did we all get a little bit excited? Look, I think it was a bit of a blow-off. Uh, I think Wall Street had been uh, uh, a bit giddy from the whole AI story and NVIDIA and so forth, and when some of the actual results came in and they weren't as stellar as everyone thought, uh, that made people a little bit ready to think, well, should I be getting to the exit on the whole AI boom? Then that uh, one monthly job number came in and probably it seems to have been quite possibly affected by some uh, hurricane activity in the US, just one Mm. number, as Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock said uh, this week. And so I think there's a bit of combination of those circumstances. The market has been the last few months growing very strongly, and I think it was a bit of a blow-off as we quoted Matt Williams from Early Funds Management uh, on page one this week. So it had that feel to me sort of all the way along. You never know with these things. They can develop a head of steam and keep going, but I, f- I felt it was more like a blow blow off as we're going along. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, Anthony, the, uh, I guess the speed and, and the sense of panic to me was quite startling, particularly on Monday and then on Monday night as Wall Street prepared for its trading day after that horrible session in Japan. What did you make of the mood of investors down here? I think everyone's a bit skittish. I mean, no one likes going to work on Monday morning knowing their portfolio is about to get smashed, and 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 that's exactly what happened. But like as Stutch just said, this one was completely driven by offshore. It's got nothing to do with the fundamentals down here, and it's a stark reminder for all the smart fund managers and analysts that we speak to that you can do all the forecasting of earnings in the world, all the analysis you want, but a big part of investing is just that tide of money going into or out of equities or bonds or whatever on, on any one day. It's what the big pension funds and sovereign wealth funds are doing. And, and you, can, you can pick the right stocks, you can get all the earnings numbers right and all that sort of stuff. But when the tide of the money's going out, your portfolio is going to get hammered. And that's exactly what happened on Monday. But, you know, I mean, it only lasted for a day or two, really, didn't it? And now, it's, now yeah. it all feels like come the end of the week, it's sort of back to normal. 
Certainly feels a lot calmer, that's for sure. Yeah, I think those the, the idea that uh, the US was headed into, you know, a, a recession in any meaningful sense, given that the US's economy has been the real driver of stronger than uh, expected performance of the global economy, and uh, it can't really see that turning into a you know like a fair dinkum recession. So I think that felt a bit not quite right as well. And it's yeah. one and today these days the. Stock markets are one global asset market, and so if you know an asset in a big market such as the US, they get priced down at all, then that's bound to flow through too. The other big thing is where everyone's positioned. Like the rate of change is important. It's it's not so much the event; it's how everyone's positioned for the event. And everyone was positioned in a sort of extreme way: positioned for AI to keep going, positioned for a soft landing, positioned for rates to come gently down, and earnings in Australia and the US to go up. Nobody sort of had any doubts around that. That was the the really strong consensus. And then you get this moment that shakes all that up and everyone starts to say, well, what if I'm wrong? And I think that's what we saw. People running from one side of the boat to the other very quickly. And now they're back somewhere in the middle thinking, oh, well, let, well hopefully we can float along. So be interesting to see if that's right. And previous to this, whenever Jerome Powell suggested that the Fed might be looking at cutting interest rates, the market would get buoyed, buoyed by that. Uh, yeah. And that's exactly what he did do just leading up to this. Instead, the market went the other way. And it's a bit like this new thing where people are uh, flying uh, you know, in their planes and this new thing about suddenly these big air pockets – uh, suddenly opening up and you know it descends really quickly and a few yeah. people hit the hit the ceiling and uh, you know come out a bit bloodied from it but the plane doesn't actually crash so maybe it was a bit like that James yeah the yeah. other funny thing about this one is that so for us it was playing out on Monday and that's as the Reserve Bank of Australia board was meeting to decide what to do with interest rates and and some punters in the US were even calling for the Fed to do these emergency cuts but the RBA didn't seem like they were moved they kept rates on hold and Michelle Bullock had a bit more to say than usual uh, at a press conference, don't you think? Oh, I thought she might provide a little bit of comfort to investors. You know, we, we sense your pain. We're, we're watching this really closely. We're, we're, we're right across it. But she basically said, look, you've all pushed valuations up too high. Take a little bit of pain. It's one data point. Stop getting so worried. And I thought it was quite a, a sort of robust, you know, response to investors who – I think we're probably looking for something a bit more uh, comforting from from Bullock, but she was in a difficult place because really the inflation numbers give her very little room to move. She doesn't want to be out there releasing animal spirits or encouraging animal spirits on the stock market because she's got a, a really big inflation problem that she has to keep dealing with. I mean, Stutch, your editorial on Tuesday implored the RBA to keep their heads. I mean- did you feel they got this right to keep rates at 4.35% or should they have hiked given the message on inflation? Well, firstly, I don't think it is uh, the Reserve Bank's role to produce some sort of greenspan put to the market that uh, to really to be there to to look after uh, investors whenever you know the share market doesn't go up for once. Uh, <laughs> it's not their role to do that. They've got to they've got to and she did make the point in her press conference that in an era as a bit of a technical point of floating exchange rates, uh, it gives inter- central banks more scope to concentrate on their own economies uh, in terms of, of policies that affect just the Australian economy. And I think the fact of the matter is that although inflation has come down in Australia quite significantly, it does seem to be sticky. Uh, and persistent at around about this 4% level. It's quite a way away from really the 2 to 3% target. Uh, uh, they've extended their forecasts as to when inflation gets back to the midpoint of that target to the end of 2026. And that's yeah. a long time to be above sort of target. And as the longer you go, the more expectations get embedded and the harder it is to really to get inflation back. And I think you can make the case that at 4.35%, the Reserve Bank is still significantly lower than other central banks, even as they're, even as they're cutting rates, the US Fed, uh, the Bank of Canada, uh, New Zealand, the Bank of England, uh, that we haven't tightened as much. And if we don't tighten uh, again now, which I think we probably won't, but what that does mean, it means, and I think they've signaled it in the statement of the board, they'll keep it at this 4.3% for significantly longer. 
Uh, as they said very explicitly, you won't get one. You won't get a cut this side of Christmas. That means they come yeah. back in February, and even then they've got to look at the data and get some comfort that it's actually headed down. So even as other central banks cut and come down to meet us, uh, we'll be holding tight. I think for considerably longer than them. You, you pressed her during the press conference, Dutch, on this idea of is the government sort of working against the RBA with all this fiscal spending that's going on? Do you think she's satisfactorily answered that one? Uh, she's in a little bit of an awkward position there because she doesn't want to get drawn into political bun fights uh, with the government and have the yeah. you know and between the opposition and so forth. But I think she made it clear, and in their forecasts, the Reserve Bank economists really increased their forecast for the amount of increase what's called public demand, really government spending, both on recurrent spending like on public servants, but also on capital, big capital projects. And that's now projected to grow like 4% plus in real terms over the course of this year. So that's really like uh, fiscal policy or budget policy is stimulatory and it's fighting against a restrictive monetary or interest rate policy. And that's really mm. become the theme. And it shows in Australia that we don't really have the mix of policies right. Uh, we're going sort of backwards on industrial relations. We're lifting up wage floors. And then we expect it all to fall onto the Reserve Bank to get inflation down, but not to cause a big shakeout in the job market. So too much, as usual, is being thrown, I think, onto the central bank to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. Anthony, you mentioned that it feels a lot calmer at the end of the week than at the start. Will there be any scarring from the market route? I mean, we were getting a bit more hopeful on the podcast about deals starting to fire up, whether they're IPOs or M&A. D does a moment like this that sort of jars buyers and sellers of assets, does it hurt confidence for capital markets? A little bit. I mean, it's a reminder that it's actually quite fragile out there. You know, like we had this big share market rally, all-time highs in Australia, same as over in the US, but it's actually quite fragile. There's not a lot of confidence that the share prices actually reflect what's going on in the underlying economy, what's going on in earnings. So when we get, you know, all it takes is one jobs number that's a little bit soft, an earnings season that maybe wasn't as fast on the AI as expected, you get this big sell-off out of nowhere. So I think it tells us there's going to be more volatility. That makes it a little bit harder for deals to get done. It means if you're going to price a equity deal or a bond deal, you're going to have to do it quickly. You're going to have to pick your time a little bit uh, with a little bit more certainty. In terms of IPOs, James, there's not much going on here anyway, either way, yeah. uh, to be honest. And in terms of M&A, uh, it might, maybe this, maybe if there's another sell-off like that, it helps bring the price of things back down and could help bridge that gap between buyers and sellers. But um, I'm not feeling like it's, it's about to go gangbusters. Yeah, fair enough. We'll stick with our Guzmani Gomez burritos for a little while to come. All right, Anthony, let's get to the main event. And as we said, Stutch is stepping down as... 13 years as editor-in-chief, taking a break and then returning as editor-at-large. Stachia returned to the Financial Review in 2011, back when print papers and advertising were still the main revenue driver, but were, you pretty quickly had to rethink the business model and just to what was some serious structural change going on in the industry. Take us through a little bit about your approach in, uh, I guess in a way, rescuing the fin. Yeah, well, as you say, James, back in 2011, you know, 90% easily of the readership and circulation and subscription of the Financial Review came from people reading the physical newspaper. Uh, and the numbers of digital subscribers was remarkably low back then. Now it's completely reversed. And 90% of or so of readers and subscribers are digital, uh, reading on their iPhones, on their iPads, on their computers at work and so forth. So that's been one of the, the most fundamental changes in... Real techno the technology basis of an industry for media has happened in this last decade or so. Mm. And it has been quite a ride to go through it. Sometimes uh, it's a new world for all of us. Uh, some of us are more <laughs> or sort of on top of it than others. Uh, you know, I was an old, I must say, I was a, you know, grew up with print and knew about that. And this new world was a bit strange. But I've, what I found was that it's trying to make sense of it, sense of it all. Think about really what is the fundamental purpose of what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah. And we're a newsroom. We're giving uh, news on business, finance, and politics to uh, busy people, to uh, largely business people. We're trying to perform that function. And so just stick to the basics of, and what I said a lot was news breaking. You know, we need to break news. The newsroom needs to be sharp, break news, things that n nobody no has known about before. 
And as well, you need to have a certain credibility about you that people are busy, they want to go to one trusted source. The sort of 2016, I think, was a bit of a hinge in all of that in that it was the year of Trump and Brexit, and it was the year really of fake news as well. And so even though everyone's a publisher, uh, being a problem for us, everyone being a publisher, news being a commo- commodified and being fake news meant that if you could have a trusted source of news, you were credible, you stick to what your purpose is. Uh, I think that's the ongoing, enduring uh, formula for thriving, surviving, because it was a bit of an issue, and then thriving in a, in a digital world. That's also the one that could get us through the AI age, I think. Um, Stutch, we wanted to look back at some of the big stories during your tenure, and helpfully you came up with a list of 22 defining stories from the past 13 years that was printed in the paper on Friday morning. Now, we've asked you to nominate five of these, the greatest hits of the greatest hits, if you want, and we're going to learn a little bit more about each of them. So I want to start with one that's actually been dominating the best read charts this week, and that's the PwC tax leak scandal which has been the subject of a five-part series by Gold Walkley winner Ed Tadros this week. Stutch, when this story first broke, did you realise it was going to be such a monster? No, it was in January of last year. Uh, uh, Neil Chenoweth, uh, he broke the news, and it was a page one, but a modest sort of page one uh, story uh, at the bottom of the page, which said that the Tax Practitioners Board, which many people probably hadn't heard of, but it registers <laughs> you know, people to do that have tax agents and the like, had deregistered uh, uh, a senior tax advisor in PwC for dishonesty, uh, and using misusing uh, confidential government information provided in the in the course of consultations over devising a new uh, anti tax avoidance multinational tax regime, he'd taken that information and used it to advise his own multinational clients how to avoid the tax, and he'd be deemed registered for that. So that was quite you know a good story, but there it yep. was. Did it go any much further than that? Wasn't quite sure, and it wasn't then till May. And but behind underneath the surface, a lot of stuff was going on, particularly with Chenoweth and Ed Tadros working their sources as a classic of a traditional newsroom and investigative journalist getting into the story, knowing their contacts, you know, and getting the information out. And they got in a position to be able to be the first then to report in May uh, a cache of hundreds of emails that had been basically. Uh, demanded by the Senate, by a Senate inquiry of interaction within PwC, which showed the extent to which knowledge of this confidential information had been shared and it had been turned into a potential and an actual money-making exercise for the firm. And from there, the whole thing just exploded. Yeah, yeah. Stutch, I want to ask you about another one. This must have been a really testing time for you as an editor, and that's when the AFR's own China correspondent, Mike Smith, was detained by the authorities and had to be got out of the country pretty quickly. Now, how did you manage this one? I'm thinking that as an editor, you must have been worried about Mike's welfare, but was part of you thinking, what a great story? Yes, you, you've, you, uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's a big wild world out there. I have had as an editor, I've had, had, a, had a reporter and a photographer detained during the um, Iraq war. So it happens. Mm. It's a it's an occupational hazard. And in this one, we first sort of, when we were told by DFAT, Foreign Affairs, that we need to get Mike out of there like straight away, we thought, well, let's just sort of wait a few days because what's going on here? And uh, But things, they got a bit more insistent. And so Mike packed his bags and was ready to go. And then after midnight, he'd knock on the door and you know, a dozen or so state police sort of basically enter his room and he's in his boxer shorts and they're questioning him about this or that and he's yeah. fearing he's going to be disappeared. Uh, so they leave, but it becomes pretty clear there's a ban on him leaving uh, and they want to question him further. You know, where's this going to end? So you do start to get pretty concerned. You work very closely with the authorities and DFAT to the extent you can. You want to stay in touch of it. You want to work out what they're doing. And they're basically, you know, they did very well to organise to basically have him uh, ferreted away in the consulate in Shanghai, along with Bill Bertels from the ABC. They organised mm. a yes, he would be questioned in a hotel, and yes, he would be allowed to get out of there. So this was done in all secrecy. Uh, it didn't, no one knew about this elsewhere going on in Australia. 
eventually he got on a plane and landed and we were very much relieved uh, when he arrived and we probably were so focused on just his safety and all that we weren't really prepared for being on top of the, the I should have been at Sydney airport to greet him and you know with a photographer and all this sort of stuff yeah. but uh, we were so concerned just to have it all nailed down that uh, and then he got whisked off to uh, to tension Australia during COVID he was in hotel quarantine for a fortnight so. yeah. yeah it's great great that Mike came through it all and yeah what a moment um Stutch, you picked Qantas as one of your big yarns, and uh, of course on Thursday the Qantas story, which kept, has kept giving for the best part of two years, and gave again on Thursday when we learnt that Alan Joyce is losing nine million dollars of incentives and bonus payments. But this all started a long time ago. I mean, if you think about the the Qantas story over your tenure. We tend to forget that there was this other seismic moment when Alan Joyce took on the unions and grounded the entire airline, which of course hit all of our travelling readers. But was just a it was a massive moment, uh, probably as big as what's happened to Qantas now. Yeah, back in two thousand and eleven, I think it was that uh, young Alan, younger Alan Joyce, yes, he did ground the Qantas Airlines. It was unprecedented. Uh, he was in an industrial dispute with the unions. There was constant. Uh, industrial action being taken against Qantas. He was trying to cut costs. This was an old government-owned airline, uh, had high costs. It needed to compete against both the state-owned airlines out of Singapore and the Middle East. And he was at an end-of-the-line type international airline. So he did really well, I thought, to, uh, you know, it was a brave, brazen move. The financial review su- basically supported that. Not yeah. everybody did, uh, but we thought it was a sort of gutsy move to you know, grab the nettle and to really get Qantas operating as a an efficient, uh, profitable airline in what is a very difficult business. And as as we know, then in two thousand and seventeen, when he turned the commercials around, we did name him uh, Business Person of the Year. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> but but there's also some stories along the way in that and which we sort of also highlighted that part of Qantas's business model is how to politically operate a highly regulated industry. And mm. so they were lobbying and we wrote these stories and broke some of these stories about uh, that Qantas was trying to limit the amount of foreign capital that could come into Virgin from Virgin's foreign owners. And it was also lobbying to get a debt guarantee from the federal government when things were a bit were going a bit tough there. So you could see there was sort of and this this idea of Qantas using its political uh, power and influence, if you like, as a very popular brand in Australia. Australians, you know, loved Qantas domestically and politically very well connected. And then so during the pandemic, when everything was disrupted, probably Qantas put too much uh, store on its shareholders. A lot of customers, including financial review readers that use Qantas a lot, really got upset by all the disruptions. Some of it was probably inevitable. And then we broke the story. Our reporter, Aisha de Kretzer, in Melbourne, broke the story that the transport minister, uh, Catherine King, had rejected an application from Qatar Airlines to fly more flights in and out of Australia. So it increased capacity and supply at a time when there was not enough flights and yeah. this too easily then became, well, is this directly or indirectly the result of a policy that unduly favours Qantas in the Australian market to the detriment of consumers? And from there, uh, it all sort of un- unravelled for, for, for Alan Joyce. Yeah, yeah. Stutch, the Banking Royal Commission was a seismic event for really the whole corporate sector. And I know James still has a sore back from spending so long sitting in the federal court in Melbourne. <laughs> now, the AFR had run a lot of the reporting by Adele Ferguson and others that led to the commission being called. But did you expect it to turn into that primetime drama? You know, the Orr and Hodge and Kenneth Hayne, did you expect it to be as dramatic as it was? Possibly not. It was a uh, high Royal Commission theatre. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of, and you know, when you are, and you should expect it, when you're under the glare of a royal commission, uh, for a lot of business people and perhaps people like uh, NAB chairman Ken Henry hadn't been used to being yeah. uh, sat in the witness box and grilled for things, and your personality, his personality wasn't suited to, to that, mm. and he, he got marked down. And really, a lot of the uh, – this was a lot of – Australian banks have really, before that, performed pretty well, I thought. You know, out of yeah. the, out of the uh, GFC, 
Uh, they stood up pretty well. They, they weren't involved in subprime lending. There were no major bank collapses, no government bailouts. And Australia, Australia did very well from its banks. But there was some bad behaviour and bad policies with consumers, particularly with like insurance policies and some wealth products, which uh, was some bad behaviour from, from there. And this all got brought out. A lot of them, they'd already reported them. Yeah. Uh, but they were reporting themselves, and this then became sort of really highlighted in the glare of, of the Royal Commission. So they came out, as we said, though, from it, bruised and bloodied, but not broken as a result of it, though the top leadership of the banks did all basically go, as uh, for most of them, as part of this. You know, uh, Ken Henry went, the, the NAB CEO went, Ian Rev from the CBA, from related from related issue, but all part of the whole banks are bad, Royal Commission type area, he went and so most of the banking uh, CEOs and chairs left as a result of that. But Stutch, I mean, by within a couple of years, the banks were at the, you know, on the front line of Team Australia during COVID and, and really sort of restoring their reputations. Yeah, and during before that, of course, there was the 2014 financial uh, system inquiry by headed yep. by David Murray, which said the banks needed to take on more capital to become unquestionably strong uh, f- for the next downturn. And they and they were they did go into that uh, into the pandemic in good financial shape with enough with strong enough balance sheets to be able to really get most of Australia through the very frightening period of the pandemic. So by the time of I think we had a business summit. Uh, or a banking summit uh, just as the pandemic was closing everything down and we had one of the top analysts saying we should be grateful. Australia should be grateful for having uh, the banks that were strong enough. So I think it is a good thing to have profitable and strong banks. Uh, They had to learn a a painful lesson during the Hain Royal Commission and fair enough, everyone's got to be held to account and uh, some people were as a result of that. Uh, But I think now the banks are still in pretty good shape. It's become more competitive. I think profit margins have shrunk at the banks. You know, their return on capital has come down, and probably had to. And there and uh, and there has been a mortgage war going on. That's been one of the one of the things of that's been notable over the last couple of years. But more intense competition amongst them, with the likes of you know Macquarie coming out as the uh, up as the disruptor. Yeah, Stutch. Let's finish with one that's a bit of a left field one, but I think it's right in your in your uh, home turf in. In 2012, the boss of Toyota Australia sort of broke with the tradition of Japanese politeness to demand industrial relations reform. I remember on the front of the paper, he was complaining about that fake sickies were basically condoned in Australia, and he was saying, why is this the case? But a year later, Holden announced that it would stop making cars here, and in 2017, Toyota had shut down all its factories too. Now, I think the Finn in its history, has railed against protectionism and subsidies. And the Australian car industry was always pretty subscale, but it was a blow for manufacturing in this country then. Fast forward to 2003, 2023, 2024, all of a sudden we're trying to revive homegrown manufacturing with this Made in Australia movement. Will this push work or is this different? Well, I think what you're right. The, 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 this ten years of before is the decade that uh, the car industry in Australia that had really started in 1948 with Ben Chifley and the Holden uh, off the production line. Uh, yeah. Is when it when it collapsed, when it ended, we stopped making cars. It was one of the big industries in Australia, but as you say, very small and subscale and inefficient on global terms. Propped up by a tariff war, which which uh, restricted competition, and that in turn encouraged a, a workplace system or industrial relations system where yeah, the workers would take Friday off. Uh, and they say they were sick and they'd have a long weekend. And the, uh, Max Yasuda, the, the Toyota managing director down here, said, well, I just can't understand this. How could, you know, does it happen? How can people do this? Uh, just take us as a sickie, you know, but it makes you uncompetitive. And what we were also going through then, a resources boom, a China, and that pushed up the Australian dollar. And yep. that really intensified the competitive crunch. I think what you're seeing now is with after the pandemic, and which has disrupted supply lines and the geopolitics that has really come back with a vengeance. I think that's really been a mark mm. of the last several years that since the fall of the Berlin Wall, etc., has been geopolitics wasn't a big thing. But now it is a really big thing for business in Australia. And the, geo, the geopolitics uh, of all this has shown up in higher energy prices, disrupted supply lines, and for politics, it's provided a bit of an excuse to bring back so-called industry policy. 
and it masks all sorts of other things that governments want to do. And I think that it's gone to already, you can see the dangers of it, where Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has already basically given away a billion dollars in subsidies to to make manufacture of solar panels in Australia. Yeah. Now, this, like the car industry, will be totally subscale. It'll have no hope of competing against the Chinese who have flooded the world markets. And the Federal Treasury has actually come out and said, it's a bad policy. Uh, that's because if we do want to diversify your supply chains, that's fair enough in this world of where you want to diversify out of China and in case of a further pandemic-like thing. But other countries are diversifying. India is diversifying into making solar panels. So is the US. We should buy them more cheaply, and that will reduce the cost to us of solar panels and reduce the very high costs of decarbonising our economy, which is one of our big challenges. All right, Stutch, we're going to go take a break now, but we're going to come back after the break and ask you to have a look into your crystal ball. Back in a sec. Welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Saturday morning, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. All right, Anthony, we'll just have a very quick look at what's coming up next week. Reporting season gathers pace. Uh, Commonwealth Bank and Seven Group on Wednesday. Cochlear Goodman Group, Origin Energy on Thursday, ASX on Friday. It's starting to get serious, isn't it, Anthony? Oh, it sure is. And I reckon if there's one result everyone should tune into this reporting season, it's Commonwealth Banks. Yeah, absolutely. On Monday, we've got a speech from the RBA Deputy Governor, Andrew Hauser, at a business lunch. It's his second outing, Stutch, and you covered his first one. What's he like? Uh, he's quite a personable uh, Englishman. Well, I wrote up uh, one of his speeches the other day where – he basically made the point that Australians don't really appreciate how how prosperous we are. And yeah. when you do the numbers, per capita GDP, uh, it's a measure of national prosperity. The UK is like a third lower than Australia. And it turns out Australia's GDP is you know, higher than Canada's, way higher than Japan's of all places. And we, we, we are quite a prosperous nation. Uh, a large part of that reflects our booming resource sectors, coal, iron ore, gas is where most of our exports come from. And the thing I take from that is if you don't really appreciate how more prosperous we are, and these are just stats, but he says living here for more than six months, he can really feel that this is a richer place than the UK. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you don't appreciate how prosperous we are, and why, why is that? Because we've given some God-given right to? No, it's not. It's because of various circumstances. But if we don't appreciate what a lucky country we are, you're in danger of squandering it. And uh, if people think it just comes to you naturally and they don't invest in actually making sure we continue, then you might end up throwing it away. And I think that's one of the real things that Australia faces. Like I'm, I'm now going away for having a break for a few months and coming back in the new year. And I think next year is going to be quite a mad year. Uh, you've got the you know, prospect of Donald Trump in the White House and you've got an elect federal election which will – most likely have a minority government, probably a minority Labor government, and it clearly won't have the authority to push through the sort of policies that are really needed, tax, workplace, regulation generally, that's needed to revive this productivity growth that Michelle Bullock said she was counting on to be able to lower interest rates and keep inflation down. So I think it's all going to hit the fan a bit next year, and so there'll be a lot of us to things for us to write about. I'm looking forward to doing that, and a lot for you to discuss on your podcast. Beautiful. All right. Well, Stutch, we, we love taking listener questions on the Chanticleer podcast, and if you've got one, send it in uh, via emailing us at chanticleer at afr.com. You can send it in audio form, of course. If you record a voice memo on your phone and include your name and where you're from, email it through to us. But instead of a listener question this week, Anthony and I are going to pose a few questions to you on some of the topics you just mentioned there. Uh, first one, you mentioned the madness of the US election to come. Who's going to win? It's a hard one, isn't it? Because so much mad things and crazy things and unpredictable things that happen, like who could predict what's gone on there in the last few months? And so it's bound to take some real twists and turns. I think you know Trump now seems to be on the back foot. He had 
Biden totally where he wanted him. Yeah. Now he's on the back foot. He's not quite sure his, his attack lines on Kamala Harris don't seem to be working. She's riding it. But, you know, and there's only a few months to go, but a lot can happen on there. Like, well, I think... Come on, Starch. Get I off think, the fence. Look, I'd, <laughs> I'd say probably she's got the momentum now. So unless Ooh. something really changes on that, I think it's possible because as Australians, we just find it hard to understand how... The Americans, and we know, you know, we all know Americans, and but we just find it hard to understand how so many of them would would vote for Donald Trump. So I'll sort of cling to that. Yeah, fair enough. What about back here in Australia, Stutch? An election due by uh, May next year. Who's going to be ruling the country this time next year? Yeah, I think it's most likely to be a Labor government in minority. Labor will probably lose seats in Western Australia. That's a real critical state, and they had big gains last time. They'll probably be in a minority government. Uh, Anthony Albanese has vowed he'll never go into any sort of coalition with the Greens. Uh, They're in furious combat on the left flank of Labor. Last time they did it under Julia Gillard, it turned out badly, but they'll probably rely on the Greens and some uh, uh, other teals and so forth to cobble together some sort of governing coalition. But as we saw last time, that was pretty unstable. And so I think, as, as I said, I think it's going to be quite a wild ride with all of that. What's the uh, what, what's the official cash rate sitting at twelve months' time, Stutch? Uh, look, I've had to to- have a total guess. I'd guess maybe they get uh, you know things the, the the narrow path and the relative soft landing. You grind it out for longer. Nothing else goes badly wrong. You might get one or two by this time next cuts by this time next year. It's all got to go right, but uh, I'd probably go for that as the as the as the standard s- scenario. Stutch, Australia's been lucky enough to have iron ore, coal and gas propping up the budget for a while now. What do you think the big industries are going to be next decade and the decade after that? Well, this is the thing. Like uh, we've just seen, you know, we're relying on the forward facing industries such as uh, lithium, uh, you know, and we've seen that that's had huge swings in volatility and now you're getting lithium operations, you know, closing down or contracting. Uh, it's hard to see that getting in any case to anywhere near the scale of the iron ore industry. It's just not going to do that. So I think, you know, we want to diversify. We want to take advantage of resources generally. I think the Earth's crust will provide a lot of still new things for Australia, as it has done historically. Uh, but we'll have to work harder. You know, as Mike Henry at BHP says, all the new deposits are going to be harder to get to. There's a lot more social license in digging anything out of the ground. Uh, we're ruling out developing things such as uranium mines, where nuclear is going to be more in demand uh, globally as a, as a power source. Uh, so we've got to work and work both the resources sector and the, uh, and the other parts of the economy, which uh, is more uh, services sector Niche manufacturing, if we can, if we if we work, but I think we've really got to get together, our act together more on policy to provide the incentives for people to save and invest in new businesses and to grow the export base in Australia. So, I think you know we're a very prosperous nation, and uh, the I think we've got to work a bit harder at sustaining that. That's riveting Dutch stuff, and it's great to be on the inside and see that that journey. I still remember when you were appointed as editor, and it was all. Seemed like a bit of a coup at the time in the in the newsroom. It was quite a big cultural change, and we all learn a lot from you. Very much, you've been a defining editor. You, you knew what you believed, and you encouraged everyone to go out and chase stories and break news, and just prod those areas that you thought we needed to, and and hopefully drive change. Well, thanks for those generous words, you too. And it's a real been a real privilege, and to have you know Australia's premier business column and premier podcast uh, under my <laughs> wing for a while has been a, a real joy to have as well. Yeah, I think that the, for for a, a column like Chanticleer Stutch, that real focus on being authoritative and trying to set the agenda for our readers is really important. But your love of news is what's always shone through, and the the your love of what you call the beautiful thing, the the great feature or interview or package or podcast, even that's what really sets the AFR apart. But Stutch. We shouldn't we shouldn't eulogise you too much here. You're not lost to us or the profession. Tell us a little bit about what's next. Uh, yeah, I'll take the rest of the year off. I've got a lot of uh, personal uh, chores to catch up on. You know, life matters that I haven't attended to. Administration, the roof's really leaking. I've got to do something about that, uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe take a week off or so, and uh, might head off to New York before the U.S. election to get a bit of a feel for that, and then uh, a few little writing projects that I've got. I'll see if they if they uh, establish themselves. And you do tend to get people wanting you to do things, which is you know a bit uh, a 
feel oh, that's good. The people wanted me to do things for a while, so I'll, I'll, I'll see if I do a few little little projects around the place, and then come back probably you know as the working year begins next year, and uh, and see what we can do with all of that as uh, as editor at large. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much for coming on today, Stutch. It's been a terrific to reminisce about some of these great yarns and and look look ahead to Anthony. Thank you for a very big week. Let's hope for a slightly calmer weekend, eh? Indeed. And Stutch, thanks so much for joining us and most of all for leading the paper so brilliantly over the last 13 years. But let's give the final word today to someone with some serious clout. Here's how the Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock ended her press conference on Tuesday. We'll see you next week. And can I just say, Michael, uh, congratulations and uh, really well done on an excellent career. And uh, I really hope you uh, enjoy retirement. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson, and Anthony McDonald, with special thanks to our outgoing editor-in-chief, Michael Stutchman. It was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.